At this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Bill Horton, who's going to introduce all of these past presidents. So Bill Horton is currently the treasurer for the Idaho chapter and has been instrumental in organizing this event. Now for the five or six of you out there who don't know Bill, people typically characterize him as the nicest person you'll ever meet. So <laughs> I encourage those five or six of you out there who don't know him to track him down. And when you do, you'll find he, he'll treat you like he's known you forever and you're one of his best friends. So having somebody like Bill involved in this part of the program has been excellent because I think he knew almost all the past presidents except for a few, which made it a lot easier to track them down as well as a lot easier to convince them to come here. And uh, so Bill, I want to thank you for all your efforts and the mic is all yours now. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, my role is just to introduce these folks, but. I did want to say a little bit about that. Of course, we had 50 years in our, in our anniversary here. We had 45 presidents over that time. A couple of them got to do, well, five of them got to do uh, double duty. And uh, we have five others that are no longer with us. So we've done well in getting 30 uh, or so of the 40 people that uh, were available. I think it's great. The, the process is, uh, for the presentation is going to be the, the first decade. I'm a, I'll just introduce the first 10 people. And um, uh, Jerry Mallett will speak for that group. And, and then uh, we'll go through that same process for the next four groups. I, I hope this turns out to be as enjoyable as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so the, uh, the first president of the, the chapter was a guy named Wendell Smith from Idaho Power Company. And I'm not going to tell you all, all, a lot about each of these guys because I, uh, I want you to talk uh, to hear these uh, people speak. But uh, Wendell and, and the uh, and a former professor from the University of Idaho, Craig McPhee, are no longer with us from this group. But the, the other eight are Paul Coupland, Terry Durkin, Monty Richards. Would you stand, uh, stand up, Monty? Uh, <laughs> Livin Peterson, Stacy Gebhardt, Jerry Mallett, Bill Platts, and Bob Bell are all members of, of the first 10 years. With, with that, Jerry, I just soon have uh, Jerry Mallet come up and speak. I will say a little bit about Jerry, as I will each of the speakers. Jerry spent most of his career, maybe his entire career, with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and has a wealth of knowledge of, uh, that he's collected uh, over those years. So I hope to have him provide you uh, a, a good recourse of that. Jerry? I've been asked to speak about the early years. There's others here, you can tell by the ones that have the most gray hair or no hair at all, that probably uh, can speak better than I can. People like Monty Richards, who's 87 years old now, uh, instrumental in the first uh, chapter. Um, the first chapter meeting was in 1963. And when you ask somebody that attended that meeting to speak to you, you got to realize that they're old enough that they have a hard time remembering what they had for breakfast, let alone what happened 50 years ago. <laughs> but despite that, I'll, I'll try to carry on. Uh, prior to 1963, most fisheries workers in the state belonged to the American Fishery Society meeting basically to get the transactions. There was no organization in Idaho. In January 1963, a group of uh, fisheries workers working in the Boise Valley formed a Treasure Valley chapter of the American Fisheries Society. And they met every other month uh, alternating between Weezer and Boise. Pretty small group, but uh, they uh, started things. The October meeting came and hardly anybody showed up. Um, Wendell Smith, the first president, said, well, that's a busy time of year uh, workload, and uh, that's why he didn't come. What he didn't say is that's the prime time for hunting big game and birds. <laughs> anyway, they had to do something different, so they decided to uh, meet once a year in the wintertime. And um, um, transition into an Idaho chapter, American Fisheries Society, and that first meeting was a winter of 1964. 
I want to speak a little bit about how things were in 1963. The emphasis was on providing good fishing. For example, the Sports Fishing Institute Bulletin's motto was to shorten the time between bites. Rough fish control was a major program at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Uh, we were eradicating lakes, putting more favorable species in them, and we even had a research project uh, trying to figure out how to eliminate um, rough fish like carp in Lake Lowell. Um, 1963 was just 11 years after the Idaho Department of Fish and Game received their first Dingle Johnson funds and were able to hire some management biologists and some research biologists. The only fishery school in the state was at the University of Idaho. It had one professor, about 10 undergraduates, and maybe a couple graduate students at the time. Uh, Earth Day and the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency was still seven years in the future, and the Clean Water Act was still um, nine years in the future. Water and air was being polluted in a lot of places in the state. Probably the worst case of water pollution at that time was the South Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River. Uh, there was enough mine influent flowing into the South Fork that when I first saw it, I I thought it looked like water coming out of the back of a cement mixer. And we're still feeling some impacts of those times. In the Clearwater River, the potlatch mill was dumping untreated effluent right into the uh, Clearwater River, and the air quality as a result of the emissions from the plant was terrible. Logging um, practices left many streams uh, debris clogged, and in some cases rechanneled. Uh, culverts were often built too small and they blow out every spring. The first of the Lower Snake River dams, Ice Harbor, had been put online the year before. Two of the Mid Snake dams, um, Brownlee and Oxbow, were online. And there was still a dam on the Clearwater River at Lewiston. And one of the major problems then, there were ongoing problems trying to find out how to get salmon smolts to leave Brownlee Reservoir and migrate to the ocean, which they never did. On the good side, salmon were being reintroduced into Clearwater River drainage, and Bob Bell here had a major hand in that. The Harpster Dam on the South Fork of the uh, Clearwater River was removed a year before, or that August actually, and Monty Richards was telling me this morning he's sitting up on the hill when they blew that dam out. Irrigation diversions were being screened in the Upper Salmon River to protect uh, migrant salmon and steelhead. And early thoughts and early actions were being taken to protect what we called North Idaho cutthroat. You now call them West Slope cutthroat. And in 1963, the Idaho Cooperative Fishery Research Unit was established and that unit would make a big difference in fisheries research and fisheries in the state as the years progressed. Uh, as far as the chapter goes, how are we different? How are we the same as you are today? I think the main purpose of the meeting was the same as it is today, to give to learn from each other by listening to presentations by by scientific people. And I think that's the major thrust of the meeting today. Today, you have a very large and diverse membership. When the group started, there were maybe 30 people attending the first meeting, and they were all white males. Big change. Today, I see in some cases you become an advocacy group, taking positions on major issues. And I think when you do that, that's good. You protect the individual biologist from the risk of being an advocate on his own. Um, in the early days, the chapter was not an advocacy group. Uh, sometimes uh, agencies would take um, 
positions. Sometimes it was up to the individual biologists to take a position. I'll give you probably the most um, illustrative example was uh, on stream protection. Stacy Gibbard, who's here today, uh, devised a program where he could evaluate altered and unaltered streams, and of course he found that the unaltered streams had greater fish densities. And he not only sold that program um, um, professionally, but he had a little singing group that went around the state entertaining and also promoting this deal. The governor at the time didn't like it, and he basically suggested to the Fish and Game Department they either shut Gebarts up or fire him. Uh, they didn't do either, and because of his efforts, we now have the Stream Protection Act. Those are some of the type of things where biologists had to take some risk on their own um, and be advocates in order to progress. We chose McCall as a meeting site very purposely. There wasn't much going on in the evenings at McCall, and it forced the membership to come together in the evenings and uh, talk to each other, get to know each other better, a chance to discuss the day's papers and maybe exchange some ideas. And that was important to us, and obviously uh, you've grown too big for that now, and I think when you meet in Boise, my experience is a lot of times you scatter and you don't have that same opportunity because of your size. In those days, most presentations were by slides from slide trays. And with an all-male membership, you had to be real careful and guard your slide trays so somebody wouldn't slip in an X-rated slide on you. <laughs> and sometimes uh, humor at the uh, banquets became a real ribald. As far as the work by the biologist in Idaho at that time, uh, the Forest Service, the tribes, and many agencies didn't have biologists uh, stationed or working in Idaho. Um, it, my recollection, there were about 23 fisheries biologists working in Idaho in 1963. The Fish and Game Department had seven management biologists and six research biologists. The, the Fish and Wildlife Service, river basins, had um, three to four in Boise. The Bureau of Commercial Fisheries, which we now call the National Marine Fisheries Service, had three to four people working on uh, the uh, fish passage on the dams on the snake. There was no Fair Labor Standards Act in those days. As a result, biologists normally worked about 60 hour weeks with no compensation for extra hours. Uh, that, that put them in the field, I think, more than you're able to do nowadays. There were less paperwork and uh, they spent more time uh, learning about the fisheries they were going to manage or the publics that they were managing these fisheries for. And in those days there was less worry about genetics. You say, boy, that's bad. Well, it was bad in some cases. We had some major programs that failed because we didn't pay attention to genetics. But on the other hand, we had some major successes because we didn't pay attention to genetics. Successes that would be much more difficult to have today. And depending on you, you, your viewpoint, that's either good or bad. Many things that you take for granted today were things that were established by these early biologists. Uh, probably an easy example is uh, the release of uh, anatomous smolts from hatcheries. The um, size of release, the timing of releases, uh, acclimation requirements and so forth um, were mostly established by work done by Mel Rheingold. I believe uh, that there, there are some differences. I think the differences between the biologist today and the chapter today and the early days are really small. And I think that um, I've always said that working in fisheries was not just a job, it was almost a calling. People that really felt that they wanted to um, give something to the resource and serve the publics that enjoyed those resources in various ways. And I think that's still the case today. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate that very much. Not being the techno person uh, up here, I forgot to put the slide up that was supposed to be here for let you know what the names of these first 10 people were. So if you can dim the lights a little bit up front, I'd appreciate that. And so the, the second group, the second decade, um, is a group of, of biologists that, that we also are, are missing uh, two, two from uh, of our fellow uh, presidents. Ted Bjorn, former professor from the University of Idaho, and Mel Rangel, the worker for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. I can say that I believe Mel Rangel's son, Ben, is in the crowd today, so that uh, fisheries tradition carries on. So the, the members that are uh, uh, in, in this group, Don Corley, uh, Ted Bjorn, John Heimer, would you stand up, John? Bob White, Mel Rangold, Al Espinoza, Jack Griffith, and Russ Thoreau. Would you stand up, Russ? We have a few of those people here, and uh, the person who's going to speak to you is a former professor from the University of Idaho, Bob White, and from the uh, Montana State University, retired from the Fish and Wildlife Service before they shifted into the GS. Um, Bob has been a great mentor to a bunch of people in this room, and I appreciate uh, having him come up from Arizona to speak with us. Bob, would you come up, please? Good morning. What I have to say is not going to be quite as uh, data intensive as what Jerry had to say, <clears throat> but uh, they asked me, I guess we ask us all to look at the uh, issues and the challenges that uh, were, were prevalent during uh, our presidency. Uh, in the mid-70s when I was president, the chapter was increasing in, in uh, participation and the membership was, gr the membership was growing and uh, we were still meeting, as Jerry said, in, in a central location that had uh, uh, access to some skiing and some ice fishing, which is always, some, something like that is always good to bring uh, more people to a meeting. Uh, and also, uh, fun was had by all, as you, similar to what we had last night. But anyway, during this period, there were lots of issues in Idaho, and Jerry has mentioned some of these, and I'll probably repeat a few of them. Uh, Long-term uh, impacts of livestock grazing <clears throat> on public lands were uh, getting a lot more of attention. Uh, the effects on uh, riparian areas and uh, associated channel degradation, increased water temperature, sediment, those kinds of things. And we're looking at, the people were looking at uh, uh, better management practices in rest rotation gra uh, uh, grazing and, and others. Uh, water use and management was a huge problem or, and, and and was emphasized uh, uh, a great deal. Uh, at that time, fish in general usually usually didn't, fish were not a, usually a beneficial use of, of water in streams. And so this was, any, any time you get into to the, uh, especially in the West, uh, the water uh, 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 battles, I guess, uh, it becomes a, a hugely controversial issue. In fact, probably, no other issue prior, uh, uh, polarizes uh, stakeholders more than, than uh, water use. Uh, there was a continued decline in, uh, in some resident stocks uh, that had been documented, and there was uh, work going on uh, <coughs> looking for the, at the benefits of reduced harvest and catch and release. And again, if, as, in terms of uh, things that might Result from that, uh, the um, there may be some some uh, interest in between the, the various user groups, which runs into some sort of some some conflict. Um, and adverse fish populations, which Jerry's already mentioned, they were, they had be, they had become uh, drastically uh, decreased, largely due to the dams and the Columbia and State Rivers, and so there was a lot of work looking at uh, better ways to move fish upstream and downstream. Uh, adults upstream and, and smolts downstream. Uh, mitigation hatcheries were developed, were uh, placed to mitigate for the loss of the huge uh, numbers of fish that once once uh, uh, came to migrated to, to Idaho, and the supplementation efforts. Uh, they move stocks around. No, Jerry mentioned the genetic things. They were moving stocks around without any kind of genetic uh, 
cons consideration. And uh, so in general, those hatcheries, there, there was a lot of work going on in terms of, uh, of, of better ways to, uh, for, in terms of getting better, a better quality smoke. And, uh, and Jerry talked about some of the release st the strategies to uh, make return or, uh, more successful. Forest practices were, had been uh, really, in general, forest practices had been uh, uh, not, not cons fish had not been considered that much in forest practices throughout the time for a lot, for a very long time. And the, uh, uh, so there was, a, there, there was quite a bit of work going in terms of, of looking at uh, better, better ways to manage uh, or, or at least pressing, pressuring the Forest Service into implementing improved management, especially related to uh, riparian areas, roads, construction, culverts, sediment, those kinds of things. And of course, there were lots of other issues. Uh, Jerry mentioned water quality issues, there was endangered species issues. There were lots of things going on in the 70s. At the chapter meetings, many of these topics were reported on. And they represented high levels of professionalism and good science. And so basically, the chapter served, as, as Jerry was mentioning, to exchange information among ourselves. We we're essentially talking to, to the choir, as we often do, and we feel most comfortable doing. And it's a very important role that, that we, we play as biologists. However, during that time, uh, I'd had a chance to go to a couple of parent society meetings, and, and I had learned that a lot of the Western chapters, uh, in addition to the technical sessions, had become active in terms of providing input into controversial, often politically charged issues involving fish and aquatic habitats to ensure that the consideration of biological data in the decision-making process. I believe this was a, an important contribution and that, that our, the, our chapter should consider doing something similar. The question was, are we doing enough? Is it, is it enough just to uh, get together and enjoy uh, or, and, and exchange information? And that's basically, and, 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 and enjoy uh, you know, our social, the social set part of the of the uh, of the meeting, or can we should we do more? And uh, in terms of of trying to maybe have an influence on the uh, uh, various policy issues in particular that affect fish and fish habitat. My feeling was that that we could and sh should do much more. Uh, one of the great values of AFS is the opportunity to become an advocate for the resource without the political constraints. When institutional processes fail, we can use AFS to accomplish what we could not individually accomplish. Collectively, we have the potential for becoming a, <coughs> a more influential force affecting policy decisions by providing credible biological input. Advocacy for fish and quality habitat is, in my view, and, and one of the more important things that AFS can do. In order, if we don't, if, if if we don't have strong positions on issues <coughs> affecting fish and aquatic environments, we fail to fully. I think we fail to fully meet the the objectives of the society. I suspected that some members, if we came up with this idea that we should become more uh, active, I suspected that some members would probably feel uncomfortable with advocacy type positions, especially associated with public policy issues and questioning the ability for us to maintain credibility. And of course, and, and that I'm sure continues today in many sections of the society. But my response was, who is better qualified to speak for fish and fish habitat? Through AFS, we are uniquely qualified to be credible advocates for the resource. 
We have a highly respected information base, high standards of professionalism, and a large pool of well-trained, talented professionals. I believe that, uh, and I believed then, and I still believe, that as long as positions are based on the best scientific information available, high professional standards, and unbiased assessment, that we can maintain credibility. And of course, we have to be careful with that, but, uh, and it is, can be a fine line sometimes, but I do think it's our responsibility to take stands on many resource issues. We're not always comfortable doing that, but uh, it, it has, uh, it, it can do a great deal for uh, furthering the cause. So we finally came down to the question, are we gonna do it as a chapter? And uh, I had received a little bit of vibration and vibes within, this, within the chapter that this might not be very well accepted, if, that we were going to move the chapter from being primarily just information exchange to one of also uh, getting involved in policy issues outside of the, uh, outside of our, our, uh, our information exchange. And, but when, when we came up to the chapter for, uh, to discuss, there was no negative uh, opinions voiced. Now there may have been negative opinions, but there were no negative opinions voiced. Uh, and we, uh, and so we, we moved forward. Based on this, uh, we initiated committee, the committee process. At this time, there were no committees, at least that I recalled. Uh, the, in fact, I remember when I was uh, nominated into the officer ranks, I know it was from the, from the there was no, uh, no committee that, you know, that evaluated officers. It was, it was just uh, uh, from, from, the, from, the, from the group. And so uh, we, we initiated that, the committee process and the, the many committees that have since uh, developed. Uh, we initiated a newsletter and uh, we started developing protocol for proceeding toward more active future, both internally and externally. And like Jerry said, the most important thing that we emphasized was that uh, we encouraged members to become act actively involved and indeed they did and I think they have continued to do that uh, through the years. So I guess uh, the 70s was a period of transition from uh, mostly a professional, social uh, type group to one that then included uh, moving on to inclu including uh, uh, advocacy for the resource. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. The, the, the third group uh, is headed by uh, Don Martin. Don is in the audience. Would you stand up, please? Uh, Ned Horner. Susan Martin was the, the third president in this group, and Susan is our uh, beloved president that died way too young, and we, if you don't know, we have a, a scholarship named after her, and we carry on her name in, a, in form of a scholarship for students in Idaho. Uh, Dave Burns. Roy Heberger, Bert Bowler, Al Van Boren, Steve Bauer, and Karen Pratt. This is the third group, and in this group, Roy Heberger has stepped forward or was coerced into speaking for this. And uh, Roy had uh, his career with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and ended up in Boise at his final years, and he's going to speak to happenings that occurred during his 10 years. Thanks, Roy. Uh, I think the first thing I want to do is acknowledge all of you. Um, <clears throat> I, have, uh, I have the privilege of organizing weekly coffee gatherings and monthly beer schooling events for biologists and other natural resource professionals here in the Boise area. And um, organizing these folks is kind of like herding cats. But every time I get together with them, I look around the table and I think about the education at that table. And I think about the experience. And now I'm extrapolating those thoughts to this group of people on the stage here and 
in the audience. I, and it's, it's really humbling if you think about it. You guys and women have an incredible amount of knowledge. And what I want to do today is encourage you to understand that I think you have an obligation to use that knowledge in a way that both Jerry Mallett and Bob White referred to. And I have to thank them for doing that because it led perfectly in to my subject, which is to, uh, in support of uh, professional advocacy. Uh, <clears throat> Bill persuaded me to be up here. And within the past few weeks, we huddled and made a change. And I've really cut back on the amount of uh, presentation I'm going to have here because I have a surprise for you. Yesterday, I spent uh, about an hour with a member of the AAA. <clears throat> and you're probably all thinking American Automobile Association. Actually, I have a hearing problem, and it was with a member of the American Academy of Audiologists that I spent my time with. And today, I'm addressing you as members of the AFS. And that's not the American Field Service. That's that student exchange organization. It's the American Fisheries Society. And the reason I say that is that I think the audiologist group and the American Fisheries Society group has a problem in that they are rec not recognized by the general public. And I think that ties back to um, what I think we should be doing as professionals as a, a better job of outreach and advocating for the resource that we're all working with. I'm going to throw out another acronym, AMA. <clears throat> I'll bet there's not a soul in this audience that doesn't know that that's the American Medical Association. They're a go-to source of information for the media. They, uh, they affect decision makers' thinking. And I think that's something that the American Fishery Society can doing, be doing a better job with. So my subject is in support of professional advocacy, and I, and I want to thank uh, the prior speakers um, for leading directly into my presentation. Uh, Dimitri used the term small fisheries world. Uh, that was a perfect lead in, too. Um, it, it is. We, we are comfortable talking among ourselves. We're preaching to the choir. It's, it's, there's a certain level of discomfort reaching out. Um, but there are elements in our society, as you're well aware, that are anti-science. And um, some of these uh, people who feel this way have been elected to public office. They're decision makers. And some of them aren't constrained by the truth. So I'm going to, I have a quote that I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> it's a cautionary quote. It says, uh, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Charles Darwin said that. And I think done right, and heeding Charles Darwin's warning that advocacy can be done right, in a read of the Parent Society's guidelines for elevating issues, resolutions, uh, you know, briefing statements, um, I think the society has done it right. But the question I have is, are they are those guidelines being adequately used by the units, by the members? Are we, are we doing a reasonably good job of getting information out to those who don't possess the gift that you have? You have knowledge. There's another quote, <clears throat> and this is in support of professional advocacy. If biologists do not rise to the challenge, who will advise on the management of man's environment? The technicians who have great skill but no understanding? That might be a little harsh. Or the politicians who have neither? <laughs> Eugene P. Odom said that. <clears throat> so my message to you is, and especially to the students and the younger professionals, um, Think about those issues that are out there. There are a lot of them that are facing the fisheries field. And, and think about a, a responsible way of getting out there and educating the public about those issues. 
I have a last quote. <clears throat> the secret to a good sermon is to have a good beginning, a good ending, and to have the two as close together as possible. That was George Burns. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to have a movie clip. I have a surprise for you. Um, it's significant that both of the prior speakers, uh, past presidents, have mentioned his name. Um, so now it's my uh, real pleasure to introduce um, a person who I think is Idaho's premier uh, professional resource advocate. Uh, in his time, he has done very much to affect the state of Idaho and its resources. In the last four years, I've had the privilege of orchestrating a legacy project in his name. And so I want to, enter, in the name of the project, its working title is The Vanishing Stream, the same as the movie you just saw the clip from. Um, it's almost at completion as I uh, present to you Stacy Gebhardt's Idaho Department of Fishing Game retired and Idaho Chapter American Fishery Society president in 1968, 20 years before I was president. Sure. Stacy. Jerry Mallett mentioned uh, the amount of time in the old days that we used to uh, spend out in the field working with fish. We'd come home at the end of the day smelling like fish. My wife didn't discover until I had retired almost 40 years later that smelling like a fish was probably genetic rather than being work-related. <laughs> People start coming to you in, the later, in your later years uh, for historical perspectives. You realize suddenly that uh, you're now being considered a bona fide uh, old-timer. And the definition of an old-timer is a man that's had a lot of uh, interesting experiences, uh, some of them true. I began my 37-year career with the Idaho Fish and Game Department in 1956, conducting spawning ground surveys on the Salmon River drainage. In 1966, uh, some 10 years later, I was uh, supervising fisheries uh, management activities and eight regional uh, biologists statewide. During that 10-year period, I had uh, 
witnessed the destruction of uh, major stream sections uh, on some of our most valuable stream fisheries. 45 miles of the Lemhi, Big Lost, and Big Wood Rivers had been ripped apart by bulldozers. And that was being done by not only uh, private individuals, but the, uh, even state and federal agencies. On the Lemhi River, <coughs> private operators were actually being paid by the Soil Conservation Service uh, for their time and expenses uh, in doing uh, their version of flood control on, on the Lemhi. The, uh, the State Highway Department in, uh, on Highway uh, 28 had really initiated the problems on the Lemhi by cutting off uh, major stream meanders, which uh, really upset the river hydraulics. Uh, a high water event in uh, the early 1970s caused, uh, because of the uh, uh, problems exacerbated by these, these channel changes, uh, nearly wiped out a section of the, the city of uh, Salmon. In 1966, I had obtained uh, approval to conduct a three-year project that had the ultimate goal of uh, uh, implementing a Stream Protection Act. The first year, we uh, examined 45 different stream types around the state. We were using uh, aerial photos and, and ground inspections. This was done on 1,138 miles of streams, and we found that 38% of them, or a total of 432 miles, had been significantly altered. 60% were associated with road construction. 19% was for uh, flood control. 13% uh, was for mining. 6% was from railroad construction. The second year, we, uh, we did uh, comparative electrofishing on undisturbed and, and altered stream channel sections of, uh, of equal length. And on average, we found that the undisturbed uh, sections produced eight times more poundage of fish. That's uh, game fishes uh, alone. I also had a, uh, a fish and game photographer who was <coughs> uh, documenting uh, the survey techniques that we were using along with uh, still photos and 16 millimeter color movies uh, on our work as well as uh, also filming ongoing uh, channel alterations <coughs> activities that were going on around the state. The third year, we, uh, we spent uh, putting on demonstrations and uh, releasing information that were the results of the, uh, the two years previous work that we had done in the field. This we provided to the state legislature and the executive branch, as well as uh, agencies that were doing uh, uh, work on the rivers. These were in the form of the 22-minute uh, the, the film that you just saw uh, bits of, and also with the slide series. Both of them were entitled uh, The Vanishing Stream. <clears throat> we also had articles and photos that we put in the Fish and Game magazine and did uh, numerous presentations of uh, sportsmen to uh, sportsmen's groups and uh, uh, all, that, that was done on a statewide basis. The Idaho governor at the time, uh, Don Samuelson, uh, expressed uh, displeasure with the, the movie and some of the other things I was uh, involved with uh, <coughs> since parts of that uh, uh, was at odds with his uh, re-election platform. We had a state senator that uh, was quite inf influential. He was a sheep rancher. He demanded uh, the fish and game director, Dick Woodworth at the time, to remove uh, segments of the uh, movie that showed sheep on overgrazed and eroding hillsides and uh, were eating up uh, streamside vegetation. 
uh, Dick Woodworth uh, re refused to uh, uh, chop up the film, and the senator cut $500,000 in operating funds out of the fish, fish and game budget that year. He happened to be on the uh, Senate Finance Committee. Well, it's obvious that the, the stream, the chances of getting a Stream Protection Act bill through the Idaho legislature uh, was just about uh, slim to none. Incredibly, Cecil Andrus, uh, who was a Democrat, won a, a narrow victory over uh, Samuelson that year, which was unusual in a, in a solid uh, Republican state. Extreme Protection Act became law, and a lot of good things happened and came about with Andrus uh, as the Idaho governor. Andrus, of course, later went on to serve as the uh, U.S. Uh, Secretary of Interior under Carter and made a lot of good things happen on a national scale outside of Idaho. True story from a bona fide uh, old timer. Thank you, Roy and Stacy, for that surprise. Very interesting. The next group, the fourth group, is uh, uh, started off here with Richard Scully. I want you to stand up when I call your name, please, guys. Wayne Paradis, Dave Cross, Chip Corsi, Tim Kokenauer, Cindy Deacon Williams, Ted Cook, Brett Roper, and Steve Ellie. And in this group, I had to twist Chip's uh, arm to come in and talk to us. So Chip, would you step up here? Chip is a, still an employee of the Idaho Department of Fishing Game and is going to give us some sage advice about this 10-year period. Well, thanks, Bill. I, uh, it's interesting. When I got the memo from Bill that I was going to substitute for Karen Pratt to do the 90s, I didn't realize that Karen Pratt would be mentioned in the previous group. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I'll uh, try and recognize Roper, maybe not Ellie, in my <laughs> remarks here. Um, <laughs> one of the unfortunate things, though, well, we'll just get into this. So, um, some pretty uh, remarkable stuff that occurred prior to, to uh, my time. Um, and so my generation was certainly fortunate to have the, the benefit of a, a legacy to build on. And I think that kind of led us a little bit into uh, the 90s. So I'll just get into this. I, I took a slightly different tack. Um, I'm going to title my talk 10 years in 10 minutes or less, uh, the Idaho chapter in the 1990s. In the world of the Idaho fisheries profession, the 1990s was a rather tumultuous and remarkable time. And since April is National Poetry Month, I'll recount this time in rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> the 90s were a time of considerable change. Many of us got our first email back then. Land management practices were being scrutinized, and it was no longer a given that XCOM would only include men. Our presidents, let's see, not Bowler, not Van Voren, not Pratt, Paradis, uh, well, they're up there. We'll skip that one. I had a great rhyme, but it won't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Big things occurred in the 1990s. Big things that affected our distinguished profession. Big things that affected how we thought about fish. Big things were discussed every session. It was time to relicense big private hydro for the first time in five decades or more. And Idaho's seagoing fish and the federal dams were all topics right at the fore. In 1990, cutthroat trout were named a state fish which started the decade off on a quite pleasant note. It was a bit of uncontroversial AFS advocacy 
and a bunch of fourth grade graders that got the legislators vote. But the terms uncontroversial and advocacy were soon to be irrevocably, I didn't say that very well, soon to be irrevocably divorced. Even as many AFS members were feeling their hands were forced. The science on hydro and grazing and logging showed these practices would, could harm sturgeon and salmon and trout. Wild salmon and steelhead were in steep decline. Of that, there wasn't much doubt. In 1991, the chapter supported the listing of sockeye salmon due to the near disappearance of the Snake River Run. In 1992, Lonesome Larry made it all the way back to Redfish Lake, but he was the only one. Before long, Snake River Chinook Salmon and Steelhead had made their appearance on the ESA list. So too did bull trout and Kootenai sturgeon. But listing comes with baggage and left a lot of people quite peeved. <laughs> The baggage came in the form of threats to the interests of hydropower and those who logged, ranched, and farmed, to the interests of folks who barged Idaho goods. Now they were the ones feeling harmed. At the same time, the political landscape took a definitive shift. And while changing demographics were no doubt a reason, so too were the conflicts over natural resources leaving a lot of biologists feeling like they were in season. In some workplaces, it was especially so. If fish were viewed as an obstruction to progress, and if you couldn't say what you wanted to work, you could hash it out at ICAFS. And there began what perhaps more than anything else to find the chapter in the last decade of century 20. Should we use advocacy as a tool to make things better for fish? Or was simply delivering the science doing plenty? Discussions could often get heated. Some stalwarts were feeling the worst. I remember one of our eminent scientists saying AFS was not the place. If you want advocacy, then go start a group called Fish First. Well, others were asking, well, if not AFS, then who will speak for the fishes? When you're trying to protect fish from a dam or a road, life in the trenches can get kind of vicious. And sometimes, defending, depending on who funded a study, the author and work would come under attack. And depending on which side they came from, they might get labeled as a hack or a quack. So we came up with the use of position statements, which we'd carefully vet and discuss. The grazing position was reasonably well received, but Snake River dams in some circles, not so much. The advocacy question still swirls around science, and science has shown that it can affect credibility. We had to wrestle with that in the 90s, and cooler heads took leadership roles to help maintain civility. But you know, as contentious as things sometimes got, <clears throat> whether you thought advocacy was the way or some demon narcotic drug, at the end of the day, over a beer at the social, we could get together and have a giant group hug. The 90s were also a time of chapter growth, as state and especially tribal programs expanded. We left McCall for the very last time. Larger venues are what the meeting attendance demanded. So we established a rotation. We'd meet up north or to the east every other year to make sure we took in all of the state and the rest of the years we were here. We pulled the secretary treasurer job out of the line of presidential ascendancy. That made it easier to get folks to run for the long-term commitment to presidency. We strengthened our committees by dedicating a long lunch at each meeting. 
Folks could assemble and talk out the issues, a good use of the time they were eating. We built a new scholarship for students to help them prepare for a career. The students established a social mixer so young and old could get to know each other over pizza and beer. That scratches the surface of the 90s. It was a decade filled with challenges and change, a decade at the end of which we started to learn how to effectively work with folks who had a stake in managing forests and rivers and range. There is still a great deal of work to do, but the profession and the resource made gains. Those listed fish hanging on, perhaps improving, but not without a few growing pains. In the, in the end, we emerged from the 90s way more better. And that's a feeling rather sublime. We advanced the use of courage, diplomacy, and science to help society save the planet, one little piece at a time. So take heart, ye future leaders of the coming generation. Challenges are part of the norm. With the advances we continue to make in our profession, I'm sure you'll weather the storm. It's said that through adversity comes opportunity, and that what doesn't kill you can help you get stronger, which is why I'm confident that after the 1990s, the Idaho chapter is going to be with us a while longer. Bart, please come up. Thank you, Bill. I knew as I prepared that Chip was going to be a tough act to follow, so I wrote a poem too. Ro <clears throat> Roses are red, violets are blue, I'm really scared, I hope I don't pee my pants in front of you. <clears throat> <clears throat> I consider it a great honor and, and frankly quite humbling to be asked to speak in this session as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Idaho chapter of the American Fisheries Society. By a show of hands, the chapter started in 1963. By a show of hands, how many of us were not yet born in 1963? Okay, that's quite a few of us. Uh, the decade spanning from 2003 to 2013 can be, par can be characterized as a period of great growth for the chapter. And I'd like to discuss that growth in terms of our mission. This is the mission of the Idaho chapter and the American Fishery Society. As I understand this statement, our purpose is to improve the conservation and sustainability of fisheries resources and aquatic ecosystems. And that we do that by one, advancing fisheries and aquatic science, and two, promoting the development of fisheries professionals. As defined by our mission statement, these are the two things that our chapter is to do. And over the last decade, we have completed a substantial amount of work in these two areas. I will first speak about our annual meetings. I believe that our annual meetings are the most important thing we do as a chapter. Over the last decade, we followed the previously established pattern of holding the odd year meetings in Boise and alternating the even year meetings between southeastern and northern Idaho. A few points about these meetings. Number one, they covered a wide variety of topics and conveyed an enormous amount of information. For example, here are the plenary session topics that were covered during this decade. Lots of information. Point number two, the workshops and symposia which are held the day before the annual meetings have been an important part of our meetings over the last decade. During this time, there have been a total of 12 workshops and symposia held in conjunction with the annual meeting and they covered a wide range of topics as you can see. Point number three, the number of contributed papers presented at our annual meetings increased substantially over the decade. Here's a graph showing the contributed papers presented at our, at our Boise meetings. In 2003, there were 38, and in 2011, that number had risen to 53. This increase mandated that we move to a, a, a concurrent session format in 2007. 
Point number four, the number of posters presented at the annual meetings also increased substantially over the decade. Here is a graph showing the posters presented at our, at our Boise meetings, and in 2003 there were just seven, and in 2011 that number had grown to 28. During the time period beginning with 2004 and ending with the 2012 meeting, there were a total of 46 plenary session talks, 412 contributed papers, and 144 posters presented at our annual meetings. A lot of fisheries information. <clears throat> Attendance at our annual meetings also increased substantially over the decade. Here's a graph uh, showing attendance at our annual meeting in Boise. In 2003, total attendance was 230, and by 2011, that number had increased to 310. Also, point number seven, during the last decade, we also placed considerable emphasis on the social fundraiser. This provided not only the opportunity for a good time, but increased fundraising revenues with tens of thousands of dollars being raised to help support our mission. Now, I don't have the exact numbers, but I believe the, the gross revenues from that is somewhere near $100,000 to support the Idaho chapter. So clearly, our annual meetings have helped the chapter advance fisheries and aquatic science and to promote the development of fisheries professionals. I will next speak about student development. Now, I believe that the development of students is one of the most important things that this chapter does. And during the last decade, the chapter placed considerable emphasis on students. And here are a few examples of that effort. The chapter continued to support the Palouse Student Subunit, which is located at the University of Idaho and currently has a membership of 60 students. In 2008, the subunit celebrated its 30th anniversary and commemorated the event with a special session at our 2008 meeting. In 2007, there was a new subunit created, student subunit at the university or at Idaho State University, called the the uh, Portneuf Unit, and that unit currently has 15 students. These two subunits are a critical part of what we do as the Idaho chapter. Over the last decade, the chapter substantially increased the number of scholarships. As we began the decade, there were two scholarships associated with the chapter. In 2006, three more scholarships were added, which are shown here. Each of these scholarships is awarded annually to students attending a school in Idaho. The scholarships were originally for $500, $500, $250 and $250 respectively, and then thanks to your contributions, Last year, those were all doubled. In 2008, another scholarship was created when the Martin family joined with the chapter to create the Susan B. Martin Memorial Scholarship. This $2,000 scholarship is awarded annually to a graduate student attending a school in Idaho. In 2006, we also created a student grant, which has award values ranging from $50 to $750 and is available annually to one or more high school or college students to help them carry out activities consistent with the mission of the chapter. The chapter also has a long history of supporting student attendance at the annual meeting and that tradition continued over the last decade. The chapter currently covers both registration and lodging costs for students in Idaho that wish to attend the annual meeting. We have also reached out in the last decade to undergraduate and high school students and encouraged their attendance at the annual meeting. These efforts have been successful. For example, high school students that were mentored by chapter members presented posters on original research at both the 2011 and 2012 annual meetings. Student attendance also increased over the decade. Uh, data were not available for 2003, but in 2005 there were 35 students at our meeting, and in 2011 that number had increased to 44. Indeed, our work with students had, over the last decade has done much to both advance fisheries and aquatic science and promote the development of fisheries professionals. Now there have been a lot of other things that we have done over the last decade, and time will not permit a detailed discussion of them all, but here are some of the other significant things that we completed. So, 
Why have we been so successful? I believe there's two main reasons. The first reason is our chapter members. The Idaho chapter has outstanding members. And over the last decade, our members have given generously of their time, knowledge, talents, and money. And that made it possible for us to do the work that I've outlined here. The second reason for our success, I believe, is our chapter leadership. Effective leadership is essential, essential to the success of any organization. And our chapter has a long history of outstanding leadership, and that tradition also continued during the last decade. During this decade, we have had extraordinary individuals serve at all levels of leadership. This has included those who have served in the executive committee as past president, president, president-elect, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and nominations chair. It has included those who have served in other chapter leadership positions as committee chairs, workshop organizers, and annual meeting auto-visual coordinators. It has also included the presidents, other officers, faculty advisors of our student subunits. In particular, I'd like to recognize each of those who have served as chapter president during the last decade. And here they are. You will note that they have come from a wide variety of backgrounds. And while they were all very different, those differences helped make our chapter strong. Each of these individuals, with possibly one major exception, did an outstanding job leading our chapter. Don't tell it, it's Jim Fredericks who's crossed out here. <clears throat> now in conclusion, the Idaho chapter has experienced substantial success over both the last decade and really the last 50 years. May I offer three simple suggestions that I believe will help ensure the next 50 years are as successful as the first. Number one, continue to stay focused on the mission of the society and the chapter. Number two, continue to cultivate excellent leadership at all levels in the chapter. Number three, continue to give generously of your time, knowledge, talents, and money. If we will do these three things, I believe the next 50 years will be as successful as the first. And I look forward to meeting with you at the meeting in 2063 to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. What a wrap up. Uh, presidents, you deserve a bow because it was great. And chapter members, you also deserve a bow because you do great, great things. This is really good. I did want to say just a couple more items, uh, uh, 30 seconds worth. Uh, these, these uh, gentlemen and lady are not only uh, leaders of, of the Idaho chapter, but there's a few of them that have gone on to do other things. I want to tell you that three of these people, uh, Bill Platts, uh, Dave Burns, and Don Martin were also Western Division presidents. And three of these people, well, two of these people and one other, Bill Platts, Bob White, and Christine Moffat were, went on to be presidents of the uh, Parent Society. So we have produced those leaders that Bart talked about and you folks are great. I just love it. Now we're going to get into a, a little bit of question and answer uh, session. I'm not sure how much time we got, Joe, but we're going to do that. And if we have some uh, questions of anybody out here, not just the five speakers, uh, we don't have much time, but please uh, ask a question of these folks. So our plan here is um, because it's a pretty big audience here, if you guys can shout out the questions, I'll repeat it. And then uh, Bill's going to bring a mic over to one of the past presidents. So I will then have one extra mic, so for Bill's going to have to take that one too. So who would like to start off the celebration? In the back there, yeah. I'll break that ice. Uh, so most of the audience are wondering where all the women in leadership are in the Idaho chapter. So the question is, where are all the women in leadership in the Idaho chapter? So which one of you want to take that on? <laughs> That might be a good one for Karen. Yeah, there we go. I'm not sure. But, um, there were several of us in, with gray hair that did serve. And I would like to encourage the younger women to do so. It's a 
it's a very humbling and exciting and demanding position. You know, if you have a family, it seems overwhelming to do either chapter work, your family, and your job, but it's a really important thing to do. I think when Susan and I, um, the decade that we were an officer, you know, things have changed a lot since those days with a lot more female faces in the crowd. And so there's no excuse that we shouldn't be having the crowd up here. So I expect in the next decade, maybe five. <laughs> so. <laughs> More questions? Hatina. I was really struck by the uh, passionate discussion of advocacy by the Idaho chapter during its first several decades, but quite struck by the fact that it wasn't talked about at all in the last decade. And I'm wondering whether some of the newer presidents would speak to the position and the activities of the chapter uh, with regard to advocating for the sustainable management and wise use of the fisheries resources in the state. So Tina would like some of our newer presidents to talk about our position on advocacy and some of the actions we've taken. So some of you presidents in the last 10 years. Um, that's a very good question. And I think the reality is that in the 90s, we came off a period of, of advocacy that Chip alluded to it a little bit, but it, it kind of tore at the part of the chapter. And uh, so the following decade was a bit of a period of healing. And I'm not saying that we don't advocate advocacy, but we, we approached it far more cautiously. And when I was president, we were being asked to advocate on a wide range of things, water rights issues. I mean, number one, it was just in terms of time, uh, it would have been overwhelming. It was overwhelming. And advocacy, if it's done properly, takes a tremendous amount of time and work. And if it's done improperly, it's very detrimental. And so, speaking from my term, it was kind of a healing uh, era. And then we modified the chapter bylaws to allow and promote advocacy, but doing it in a very measured, uh, controlled way to be sure that it was thoroughly vetted. Anyone else? Uh, I was sort of in that crowd in the beginning of the change, if you want to call it that. There, there was a lot of meanness between professionals. We forgot we were all on the same team for a little while. And I think that um, impeccable science is the best advocacy you can do. And committee work not be underestimated. Committee work is critical to being sure you have impeccable science. And that's why the position statement route was taken. And Steve Bauer was really involved in the helping establish the criteria that we used as a chapter to pick something to work on with our limited resources. It looks like some of those divisions have lasted. I'll speak to that too. I appreciate the question. Um, and frankly, in the term that I was in office, um, I was not a supporter of advocacy. Um, I had saw what it had done to our chapter, and it wasn't good. Um, and what I saw was like re echo what Jim said, is we were being asked to weigh in on a large variety of issues. And frankly, we had chapter members that were on both sides of those issues. Advocacy tends to go more towards value judgment. And as I understood the mission of the chapter, it was to, uh, to promote uh, that we advance fisheries and aquatic science and, and not values. Uh, and I know that this is, there's strong feelings on both sides of this, and I'm aware of this, I'm just telling you how I was as president. Um, and uh, so what I decided to do is we would focus on the science part of it. We would provide work on focusing on providing information, science, 
undisputed facts to our members, and then we would let them govern themselves as to what, what they did with those. I'm not one of the newer presidents, but I, I do want to speak on this issue. <laughs> I think there are some issues that are very important and most of the membership would agree on. And I think it's more important right now to have that voice uh, for the resource because under the present political situation, the Fish and Game Department can't speak on some issues. The state, the governor decides what the position of the state will be. And some of the federal agencies can't speak on some of these things because of the politics involved. So I don't think you should take positions on everything, but there are some very important issues that I think you could mostly agree on. And I think it's important that somebody speaks out for the resource. The resource needs an advocate and the agencies are not able to do it like they were in the past. And frankly, uh, in today's uh, Scenario, if Stacy would have done what he did back then, he'd have got fired. Just plain and simple at the end of the day. So you need to think this over very carefully. And uh, if you don't speak out on the most important issues, who's going to do it? All right, we'll do. All right, well, this will be the last question or the last answer then. Yes, I, yeah. I think these type of issues, they go through their process and it was i mean one of the things that wasn't touched on here that was rough for our chapter is i believe jerry talked about you know we started the mitigation hatcheries we didn't worry about genetics we were trying to get things done but then as the science about the genetics came on we went through as we learned things we went through a pretty rough period with our hatchery members a lot of those folks felt like the FS meeting was a hatchery bashing session. And it was just, it wasn't personal to them. It was the maturation of the issue. Obviously, the Sacred Dam issue was a massive one for us. It was very emotional for us. It was very draining for us. But I think it was important to go through that process. And it was a process. And I think we quieted down one because it was a very emotional process it was hard there were hard feelings but these issues mature and as one of those that was in the middle of those rough periods over the snake river dams one of the things that was pretty odd is on the session tomorrow is because sequestration no fishery won't be able to come and one of the options we discussed about was having myself give one of the Northwest Science Center presentations for them because I understood the issue, but also we had come to a lot better agreement on the science. But I think we just matured on a lot of these issues, and right now we don't have a real big driving one that would coalesce us together to go through, and it is, it needs to be the hard work to get a good position statement out for an organization such as the AFS, but also on the Sacred Dam one, it moved to the Western Division. The auto chapter took a lead, but then we on the Western Division has been in that and has still been playing that type of advocacy role for our chapter. But we've learned and we've matured on it and we've built a much better process. But yeah, don't be afraid if there's an issue that needs to be taken on to take it on. But you need to do it well and respect those with different opinions in the organization. So I'll get us going. Well, I wish we could uh, keep going, but our time is up. Um, we're already kind of halfway into our breakdown, but I hope all of you uh, enjoyed this uh, session as much as I did. I really appreciate it.